Hello, hello. Hi. All right, so we're going to talk in Chapter 10 about human resource management. And this is a whole lot bigger topic than it was maybe 30, 40 years ago when my father was doing it. All right, let's go through the learning objectives, explain the importance of human resource management, and describe current issues in managing human resources. Illustrate the effects of legislation on human resource management. And we know all of that. We read all the time in the news about changes in labor laws. Summarize the five steps in human resource planning. Describe methods that companies use to, create, to recruit new employees. So where are we getting all these new people? And explain some of the issues that make recruitment challenging. Uh, number five, outline the six steps in selecting employees. Number six, illustrate employee training and development methods. Trace the six steps in appraising employee performance. So we're going through the whole gamut of human resources here. We're starting with the employment. Now we're doing employee performance. Summarize the objectives of employee compensation programs and evaluate pay systems and fringe benefits. Demonstrate how managers use scheduling plans to adapt workers' needs. Uh, to workers' needs, sorry. Uh, describe how employees can move through a company promotion, reassignment, termination, and retirement. And finally, explain the role labor unions play in representing workers, including methods used in resolving labor management conflicts. So there's a lot to talk about here in this chapter, and that's kind of why this is going to be a little longer lecture than I typically give you guys. So human resource management used to be called personnel. That was my father's position. He was the director of personnel for several hospitals. Two key factors in HR's changes, organization's recognition of employees as their ultimate resource. And second, obviously, changes in the law that rewrote many traditional practices. So here's kind of an overall picture of what human resources encompasses at this point in time. And we're looking at a lot more than just hiring, just just the selection process. We're looking at motivation, training and development, employee union relations. So we're going to start here with social legislation. These are the things that have made human resources more complex. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, which included Title VII, the Equal Employment Opportunity Act, and it led to cases of reverse discrimination resulting from affirmative action. Then there was the Civil Rights Act of 1991. It governed sexual harassment, which is still being talked about today. I, as a matter of fact, the school had me go to a website to take training in sexual harassment for non-managers. <laughs> uh, laws protecting employees with disabilities and older employees. Vocational Rehabilitation Act, Americans with Disabilities, ADA, that was huge, made major changes in the work environment. And of course, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act of 67. And you can see, maybe you can't, but I know I have, that there is still dis age discrimination in the workplace, but it's called something different. And that's the way many employers get away with, with being able to do it. HR managers are required to keep abreast of laws and court decisions to effectively perform their jobs. Um, in human resources, if you go take a look at any human resource uh, magazine or go to a website that handles human resources, you're going to see that every January there are changes in states all across the country with regards to labor law. Employers must know and act in accordance with the legal rights of their employees or risk Court, costly court cases. Legislation affects all areas of HR management, from hiring and training to compensation. Court cases demonstrate that it is sometimes legal to provide special employment or affirmative action, 
and training to correct discrimination in the past. And this is still an issue that's ongoing today. New court cases and legislation change human resource management almost daily, constantly changing because new changes, changes in laws are happening all the time and employees go out and find lawyers who know about that. So the five steps in the planning process. Number one, preparing a human resource inventory of the organization's employees. And that includes preparing what's called a job analysis. I worked at a company years ago where the, uh, the owner of the company, the founder, was very proud of the fact that there were no titles in the company. When she started it, which was like five people in a garage, it was just get the project done for the client. There were no specific job descriptions. When I got to the company, the company had 50 to 60 employees. So now there was a need for segregation of responsibilities, job descriptions and job titles. One of the reasons that those are that I, I explained to them that it was important is that if you feel that you need to hire people, if the work isn't being done efficiently for the clients, the first thing you need to do is figure out what skills, what specific skills are needed to improve the process. And then you go look at the job descriptions and see which job description entails having those skills. That's the job, that's the position, that's the job title that you want to advertise for. Assessing future human resource demand, assessing future labor supply, and establishing a strategic plan. These are kind of all together in one. It is now the responsibility of human resource, not just to hire today, but to work with senior management in planning for the future. Where is the company going? what skills and abilities are going to be needed for that, and then determining where you're going to find the people with those skills. So here's a job analysis. You can take a look at this on your own, but a job description. Primary objective is to sell companies' products to stores in Territory Z. Duties include servicing accounts and maintaining positive relationships with clients. So that's a general description of the position. This is what the person is going to be held accountable for. Selection can be very expensive for companies, 50% or more of annual salary, which is why I always recommended to my employers, rather than firing somebody because they weren't doing the job, spend the time to teach them, if possible, how you want it done and train them to do it well, because it's cheaper when you have somebody already in your employ to train them up than it is to go out and find somebody new. Uh, steps in the selection process. Get the application forms. Conducting initial and follow-up interviews. Giving employment tests. I did that years ago to find out whether or not people really knew how to do a spreadsheet. I didn't want people who knew how to plug numbers into a spreadsheet. I wanted the person who could create the spreadsheet people were plugging numbers into. Conducting background investigations, obtaining results from physical exams, and establishing probationary periods. It's important to note here that when you are applying for a job, typically these days the application is online and it's going through software that is written to eliminate people. So if your application and your resume don't include the words that were used in the job description as it was advertised, then you're going to get dumped. So you want to make sure that you're not just sending out a resume to the same, the same resume to all the jobs. It needs to be tailored to the job description and what was advertised. Contingent workers. Number one, obviously the gig economy, the, the Uber drivers and such. Um, contingent workers may be used when full-time workers are on leave or when there is a peak demand for labor. I just saw an advertisement and an article in a paper, the paper the other day about UPS. UPS is starting to hire up for the holiday season because 
they have more packages to deliver. They need temporary drivers, drivers for, say, October through December, the holiday season, the fourth quarter of the year. Uh, the post office typically does a tremendous amount of hiring in August and September for the same reason. These workers, contingent workers, typically have few, if any, benefits, and it's not the great pay. Training and development leads to higher retention rates, increased productivity, and greater job satisfaction. Obviously, we all know if we have the training and the knowledge to do something better, we feel better about doing it. Training focuses on short-term skills, whereas development focuses on long-term abilities. Here are the three steps that are used for training and development. Assessing organizational needs and employee skills to determine training needs. So what do we need people to do? What do we need to train people to do that? Designing training activities to meet identified needs. This is all very basic planning. Evaluating the training's effectiveness. Number three is probably the most important to your program. Is it working? Because if we don't evaluate the training, we don't know whether or not it's really working and doing what we want it to do. Common activities, orientation. Think back to the last job you, where you didn't have an orientation and they just said, go do it. That's kind of like on-the-job training, so to speak. Uh, apprentice programs, off-the-job training, vestibule training, job simulations. Job simulations are done a lot for the fire department because obviously you can't put trainees into an active fire situation, but you can simulate what's going to happen in that situation off-site. Why good employees quit? Well, we see 35% quit because they're unhappy with management. 33% limited advancement. So remember, if you're working for a small company and there are maybe two managers above you, what's the chance that you're going to be able to move ahead? Unless those people move up or quit and go somewhere else, you're pretty much stuck where you are. Performance appraisals. This was something else that I was responsible for as a controller. I was typically the de facto uh, director of human resources as well, and I created the annual reviews, the paperwork for the annual reviews. What do we use performance appraisals for? Training needs. Do people have the skills that we need them to have? Do they need more? As a promotion tool, Good appraisals typically lead to promotions. Recognize workers' achievements. And we talked about in Chapter 9 about motivation, that one of the key motivators to employees is recognition of achievements. So let's use those performance appraisals for that. Evaluate the firm's hiring process. Judge the effectiveness of the firm's orientation process. So how well are we orienting people to the culture of the company, and then used as a basis for possible termination. Fringe benefits, those are things that you get other than your salary or your hourly, rate, your hourly pay. For example, sick leave, vacation, pension plans, health plans. They account for 38% of payroll, and I'll bet none of you knew that sick leave, vacation pay, none of that is required by law. Those are all benefits that have come about over time. A lot of them came about in the 50s when guys were coming back from World War II and companies wanted to hire the best people. Well, if you want the best people, you've got to offer more. So they started offering uh, sick time, sick uh, health insurance, dental insurance, vision insurance. Now it's a whole package and pretty much everybody expects to get that when they get hired. Flex time. Flex time plans are where the company says, for example, uh, everybody's got to be in the office between 10 and 2. But the remainder of your eight hours can be made up at any point in the day. Generally incorporate a core time, which is what I said, that 10 to 2 thing would be considered the core office time. Allow flexibility with work-life demands. 
doesn't work in all organizations because sometimes you need certain people to be in the office for eight hours a day and during the working hours. Working from home has become huge. After this sl slide was done, which was probably several years ago, COVID hit and working from home became the rule rather than the exception. So working from home gives workers the flexibility to choose their own hours and to take time out for personal tasks. I'm working from home right now. This lecture I'm recording on a Sunday afternoon. It requires a self-discipline to stay focused on the job and not allow yourself to be distracted. It also, working from home has a lot of the same challenges as online courses where you have to be self-motivated. Benefits. Benefits to the organization are increased productivity because less sick days, fewer absences. And higher job satisfaction for the employees because they're not commuting back and forth. That commuting really takes a toll after a while. Broadens available talent pool because if you don't have to be in the office, you can be living pretty much anywhere. And that's kind of what's happened since COVID. Uh, decreases traffic congestion for society. For employees, it helps the balance of work and family, and that's become very, very important to a lot of people. Challenges of working from home. Um, for the organization, this is always the big one. Uh, when I suggested that we let people work from home, I, but the response typically from the owners of the companies was, how do I know they're really working, right? Uh, it also, to a certain extent, complicates the distribution of tasks. Uh, for the individual challenges, the feeling of isolation, and I think even more important, being able to let people at home know that when I'm in my, my home office, I'm working. I'm not available to take out the garbage, walk the dog, watch the kids. I'm working and I can't be interrupted. Moving up, over, and out. So promoting and reassigning employees. Promotion from within improves morale because it gives people the, the opportunity to move ahead. It tells them there are ways for you to increase your skills and move ahead in the organization and get better jobs. It's also cost effective because if you're promoting from within, you're not running around hiring from without and going through that whole process that we looked at at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, terminating employees, probably one of the most difficult things, and I've done it quite a bit over the years. Employment at will is limited in most states. Terminating employees exposes the company to illegal actions. Uh, terminating members of a minority or other protected group definitely has problems and ADA bars discrimination, so you can't fire someone on the basis of their, dis of their disability. Uh, retiring employees, downsizing with early retirement, that happened a lot during COVID. People just took their retirement rather than sitting around waiting to see if there was going to be a job available when businesses opened up again. Losing valued employees. Always have an exit interview. And they should, should always be getting written documents from employees who are leaving. What did they do? How did they do it? Documentation of their, don't let them take all that vital company information in their heads away from the company. Ah, labor unions. While the technological achievements of the Industrial Revolution brought countless new products to market and reduced the need for physical labor, it also put pressure on workers to achieve higher productivity in factory jobs that called for long hours and low pay. You can see how these types of conditions made it possible for the workers to turn around and say, we need to unite. We need to negotiate with the, with the company as a group. There's strength in numbers. Collective bargaining is exactly that. Collective bargaining is the group 
bargaining for benefits and, and compensation. You have contract negotiation, wages, hours, conditions of employment. I belong to a union. We negotiate with the school every three years. Uh, you can have a union shop agreement, agency sh shop agreement, open shop agreement. Legislation for workers to give them a choice about joining a union, right to work laws. And what's happening now is the government is starting to step in and say that workers can accept the benefits of unions without having to pay dues. That's been a big issue for unions. When workers feel they are not being treated fairly under the contract, they can file a grievance. Common grievances, overtime rules, promotions, layoffs, transfers, job assignments. And most are resolved by someone called a shop steward. That's a worker in the company who represents the union for the employee. Some union tactics, obviously strike, a primary boycott, or a secondary boycott. And then management responds with things like lockouts, injunctions, and strike breakers, bringing in people to do the work that the striking workers aren't doing. Mediation can occur when there is an impasse. So two ways for unions and management to, to discuss things and come to agreement Mediator makes a suggestion, but neither side has to follow that suggestion. Arbitration, however, is an agreement to bring in the third party, and the third party's decision is irrevocable. It's a binding decision on both sides. And that takes care of unions and labor. Have a great week.